Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to NASCA's national webinar series. We're thrilled to have you here today with us. We've got an exciting panel. We'll share their insights and thought leadership with all of our NASCA members today. As you're dialing in, take just a moment to uh, make sure you rename yourself so we know your name and your state agency or your company that you're with. We wanna make sure that we have an opportunity to network with you, engage with you. Um, also make sure you check out NASCA's social media. We are on Twitter, LinkedIn, and a new Facebook page. So have an opportunity to seek us out, engage with us. Um, as a matter of fact, why don't you go ahead and drop in your LinkedIn profile to the chat and you and your colleagues can have an opportunity to connect and we can as well. So again, thank you so much for joining us. I'm Pam Goins, the Executive Director here at NASCA, and we're excited about today's conversation all around leave management, policies and practices in state government. Um, we know that the pandemic certainly um, had a shakeup in all human resources activities, but we wanna focus our efforts today on leave management, really talking about employer paid time off, unexpected costs and liabilities in state government, the real need that we have to examine state policies and practices um, to determine the balance between what's best for the budget and also what's best for your employees. We have an exciting group of panelists here with us today, um, and we're going to get a chance to know them, um, dive into a, a paper that UKG has just produced. We're excited that we're gonna be working with UKG to um, produce a key takeaway document. From that um, overall paper, you'll be seeing that to the NASCA general membership very, very soon. Again, make sure you connect in the chat. Let us know who's here. Drop any questions that you might have in the chat. We're gonna be taking some time at the end to um, address your questions and meet your needs as well. Let me first introduce our um, facilitator today, Richard Green from Barrett & Green. Um, again, he has a wealth of knowledge, a great background, writes a lot with many of our sister associations with our corporate partners as well. Rich is gonna take us through the first poll and then introduce the rest of our panelists. So Rich, I'm gonna turn it over to you today. Thank you so much, Pam. It's a pleasure to be here and I appreciate uh, I appreciate NASCA's work and support uh, in the work that we've been uh, doing about leave and, and a number of other things. Um, I guess uh, the, we're gonna begin with a, uh, for the audience members, we're gonna begin with a little poll question, which should be appearing on your screen right now. I'll read it to you. It says, leave benefits in fact states in many ways. Which of the following concerns do you have when it comes to your state's leave programs and policies? And you can check all that will apply. And then by magic, technological magic, we'll see who said how many of you said what. And, uh, and we'll talk about that for a little bit. So I'm gonna give you, oh, I'd say 35 to 40 seconds to read through the questions. You can check all that apply. And then we'll talk about that for a minute or two before we really get rolling. So push away. And now here we have the results. Um, we see actually what's, what's, what's really interesting here is that everybody is worried about everything, um, which, is, which is fascinating. You might've thought that there would be, uh, there would be a, 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 a tendency toward uh, picking one or two of the items. It looks like everybody's concerned about unbonded liabilities. That's uh, I guess 50%. Um, and uh, the biggest of them all uh, the concern that seems to be the only one that really kind of stands out uh, is second from the bottom on your screen. You can see now employee morale, engagement, recruitment, and retention. I'm actually in a few minutes when I talk a little bit about the report that we did for uh, UKG. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about that because that, that, that seemed to be a very important thing to us. And uh, interestingly, uh, the thing that seemed to be of least concern are weak internal controls and oversight. So that's what you guys had to say. Very interesting um, and, and really gives us a nice, a nice sort of a roadmap for that which will follow in the conversation we're gonna be having uh, over the course of the next uh, 52 minutes or so. Um, let, me, let me move from here to introduce uh, my esteemed fellow panelists. Um, 
Uh, we have with us Alicia Hunt, who is the division head for human resources for the Arkansas Department of Transportation. We have Linda Misigatis at UKG, the sponsors of the report that we'll be talking about in a few minutes and perhaps uh, longer than that. And we have Catherine Barrett, um, who is, as you saw in the introductory screen of Barrett and Green Inc. I am green, she is Barrett. We are married to one another. We sit next to each other. We are not just a virtual reality kind of a image for you. Um, so that's who we have with us. I can guarantee you I've spoken to these people. When, when uh, Kath and I were working on this big report, we spent a great deal of time talking with Alicia and with Linda, both of whom are really quite not just articulate, but brilliant and very, very knowledgeable. So it's, it's, it's an honor for me to be able to uh, help facilitate their capacity to share uh, their best and brightest thoughts, comments, and wisdom with all of you. Um, maybe the good place to start um, might be for me to just talk a little bit, maybe just for three minutes, about uh, some of the findings of our report. Um, Really, the biggest finding we had, uh, if, you, if you just find finding is something that you didn't know before you started and you found as you were doing it, is we found out that this thing was way more complicated than we ever thought. Um, it is typical when Kath and I work on a paper or a report or an article together, that we always start off by saying, well, this is going to be pretty easy and pretty straightforward. Um, it never, ever is. In this particular instance, it particularly wasn't. Um, we did not realize the confusing interplay of rules, of processes, even terminology, which may vary widely from place to place and even vary widely within individual places. People aren't all talking the same language. Um, we're all trying to climb to sort of the, the, the mountaintop or build a building might be the better uh, reference uh, that'll bring us to the, to, to, to the stars of better leave management. And it turns out that in many cases we're uh, we're not, building a, uh, we're not building a tower to the stars, we're rather building a tower of Babel because um, we're not all talking the same language. Um, and what we realized as well, when we first started off with leave, we knew because we've written about uh, parental leave, pay parental leave, because that's a very hot topic and I'm sure we're gonna be talking about that some. Um, we hadn't quite realized just how many different kinds of leave there are, where there's time off for illness, there's time off, as I said, uh, paid parental leave for the birth of a new child, vacation days, holidays, time off to make up for uh, overtime in lieu of cash, which is a really interesting topic, um, days off to provide military service. Um, and then there's something called administrative leave. I'm hoping Catherine will talk about that a little bit later on, which is just a mishmash of different kinds of leave that, that, are, that are given um, for a variety of purposes by supervisors. So very complex each one different, each one different rules, each one different regulations from state to state, and even as I say, within states. Um, we found a number of places where leave is managed well. Um, for example, in, in Arkansas. And uh, that's part of the reason why I'm looking forward to hearing from Alicia, because we have a lot to learn from her. Um, and we also found a lot of places in which that's just not the case, where leave just is not well managed. And the problem is when it's not managed fairly, and it's not managed consistently, it can negatively impact on an entity's finances. It can spur time-consuming lawsuits. And I'm sure those of you who are in, who are in HR departments have, have encountered lawsuits over leave policies that were unclear and people didn't think they were getting what they were supposed to be getting. It can complicate staff management. You really would like this not to take a whole lot of time. You'd like it to be nice and clear and neat. And when it's not, it just takes time that's not, uh, that's not present. And, and it can lead to the deterioration of employee morale and engagement. And as we saw in the beginning, that seemed to be uh, the greatest concern of the those of you who answered the question. That last one I'm gonna talk about just for a second. Um, given the fact that leave is used um, to attract people to uh, government employee, uh, particularly since uh, government uh, compared to the private sector uh, just can't compete anymore uh, on, uh, never really could, on pay, and used to be able to compete on, on better uh, pension plans. 
but that increasingly is less of a really strong, attractive uh, element in, in, in getting people to come to work for state and local government. Um, leave, however, is, is a good thing. People, people may not care so much about pensions when they're 25 because they can't imagine they're gonna be there or any place in particular in two years, much less 40 years to collect their pensions. Whereas leave is something you get right away your first year. So it's a real powerful inducement, but when leave policies aren't well managed, um, you can maybe gain on recruitment, but lose on retention. And that's not a very good thing. I'm gonna hit a few more quick points and then move on to the panelists. Um, these, these are a few of the things we're gonna be talking about today. Um, HR officials now seem to be wondering about the impact of uh, increased telework on sick leave usage. This is something that was not a concern, particularly even though people were doing telework prior to the pandemic. Um, it's become a far uh, greater, uh, greater issue uh, for us today. Um, there's a portion of unused leave that can be cashed out when employees retire or separate from government service. Um, that can create a long-term unfunded liability. That's a real issue. Uh, particularly an issue, as our panelists will discuss, uh, given the pandemic. Um, in a perfect world, employees would uh, honestly utilize their days off. It's not a perfect world. They, a lot of them do. I'd like to trust that most people do, but some don't, and this is a responsibility for management. And, uh, and the last thing that I thought I'm on is just uh, leave administrators also need to understand the technologies that can ease leave administration improve transparency and control costs. I'm hoping that Linda will help to, uh, to inform us about that. I know that's uh, an area of special expertise for her. Uh, one of the few, it's not, technology is never a solution. Technology is only a tool, but technology is one of the most powerful tools for controlling all the, uh, all the other issues with leave. Um, so enough of me, let's, 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 let's hit it off with our, uh, with our panelists. And if we could start with, um, if we could start with with uh, leave leave benefits uh, uh, that, uh, that 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 deal with leave liability, as as, as I just mentioned, and uh, the the unfunded liability issue uh, are expected cash payouts upon retirement resignation, and uh, and I don't know who to start with, but but uh, maybe Alicia, would you like to kind of kick off there? Uh, sure. Yeah. Thank you. Um... At our dot, you know, we have caps on our annual leave. We have two two different main types of leave in terms of what employees accrue: uh, annual leave and sick leave. Annual leave is basically vacation; it can be used for anything, and it's also payable upon separation after an employee has been with us for six months or more. And we have sick leave, and so our accruals we have um, a, a carryover accrual limit on annual leave balances from year to year. So that limits the amount of payout that we would give out for annual leave. For sick leave, we do not have um, a cap, but we do have a bonus that's available for employees upon retirement. If they have at least 400 hours of accrued sick leave to their credit, then they can get a bonus payment of up to $7,500 at, at retirement. Um, for, for us, that's a, since sick leave is really only available to be used for specific purposes. It's not, um, you know, payable upon separation traditionally like the annual leave is. And so we see that as an incentive for employees to manage their leave balances, you know, more responsibly, it gives them something to shoot for. You know, yeah. thing, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I, know, I was just going to jump in here and to say that, that Arkansas really has this under control and a lot of states don't. Um, we were really interested in leave liability when we did the research um, because there, you know, everybody talks about the liabilities that governments have for pensions and uh, other post-employment benefits. Um, leave liability, um, which is listed on in uh, annual reports as compensated absences, um, that it's much smaller, but it's still significant. I mean, if you look at uh, California, it has about four billion in in leave liability. Massachusetts has something somewhere between 600 and 700 million in, in 2020. And, and while Alicia is talking about a bonus of $7,500, that's what you said, right? $7,500? Yes. Um, you know, we saw a report from the Massachusetts Inspector General to the legislature um, that talked about, you know, how expensive leave had gotten for the Commonwealth um, and he cited a, um, 
a community college president who, um, on departing from state and you know employment, um, could cash out to something like I think it was two hundred and sixty six thousand um, dollars in terms of you know the leave uh, leave that he had stacked up that was owed to him by the government. And the one other thing I would say is this is tough for agencies because a lot of times when people leave. Um, their their work, the agencies are responsible, you know, in that year for paying that large sum of money, if it is a large sum of money. That's that, that's really well put. Let's talk a little bit about, about leave abuse. Um, we quoted Alicia uh, in, in, in the report, I think, the, 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 well, actually, I know, because it's written in front of me, I can't lie, I'm pretending I, I remember this. Um, it, we said, uh, the best way, she said, the best way to lose a good employee is to do nothing about a bad one. Do you want to comment on that a little bit? Yeah, you know, that was a, a, a saying I came across a few years ago, and it's just something that kind of stuck with me, um, and it's what we tell managers a lot of times, that, you know, when you ignore little problems that, that create, you know, animosity and employee morale issue on the crew, it, it really can build up into something bad, and, you know, I tell you, during the pandemic, um, the some of the worst, it was, it had some of the worst effect on employee morale when it came to perceived um, you know, leave abuse, people who were, who were maybe taking advantage of some of these federal leave policies that were handed down. I know we have that topic to come up later, but, um, but when employees perceive that an, an employee who's coming in late or, you know, missing work uh, frequently that doesn't appear to be being, being checked or disciplined by a supervisor, they get really frustrated. And eventually, you know, it leads to apathy. It leads to um, to a decrease in morale. And employees are like, well, you know, why should I bother showing up on time? And, you know, for us, we we hear from a lot of frustrated supervisors, and especially when it comes to employees who who tend to abuse things like uh, FMLA protected leave. They'll they'll take leave above and beyond what's authorized by the physician, and that forces us into this you know constant process, and that takes a lot of time and energy to manage. You know, when you're dealing with ADA, you're dealing with FMLA, and, and you're trying to overcome the perceptions of, of a crew that an employee in one of these situations is getting away with something. You know, you can't share their protected health information, and so it, it becomes quite challenging for supervisors. Okay, and let me just back up a little second, and then I want to go to, to Linda. So ADA is the American Visitors with Disabilities Act, and FMLA yes. is the... Uh, pay, uh, Family uh, Medical Leave Act, right? The Family, Family Medical Leave Act, right? Yes. Okay. Um, Linda, I'm, I'm, I'm turning to you for solutions. <laughs> wow. Um, no pressure, Rich. Um, <laughs> you know, it's interesting because um, to the point that you made at the beginning, um, this is one of the most complicated, I think, aspects of management in government um, because it also is used in a way that it is a benefit as well. And so, you know, I know we were chatting in our preparation for this and thinking about how oftentimes leave is given in lieu of being able to give a, um, a raise or in order to attract employees, you're giving more time. And you wonder sometimes, are you perpetuating the problem um, by giving this? Um, but when it's all you have to give, um, it creates that dynamic as well. And so, you know, I really do think that the, the challenge that comes into play as well as not having the right solutions and systems in place. Um, you know, Alicia, those guys have such a, a great um, setup in Arkansas as far as how they manage their policies and really taking a look at that. But that's not that common um, that we see across government because it's often very decentralized as well. And so if you don't have, um, you know, some type of central management, if you're leaving it to your managers, for example, to be responsible um, for how their employees are, you know, using their time. Um, and there's so many different types of time, um, like we were talking about, you've got basically vacation, sick, administrative, all of these different, and they all have different policies around them as well. And so how do you effectively manage your workforce to ensure fair and equitable 
you know, policies are in place, but then what's more challenging, I think, is actually the enforcement of those. And so, you know, I always give a tremendous amount of credit for HR professionals in government um, because it is no small task to try to stay on top of all of those things. Because um, to Alicia's point, there are things where you can't, um, you can't disclose. And so employees may think that there's, you know, inequity or unfairness happening, but you can't talk about what might be happening with employees. So yeah, I think, you know, it's not an easy solution for sure, Rich. I wish I had the the answer for everyone, but I do think, you know, having, um, having some systems in place to help manage and support those policies certainly goes a long way to, um, to at least making the process easier um, to manage. Great. One thing we didn't hit on, and before we change topics at all, Catherine, could you talk to us a little bit about about uh, about burn hours, about taking leave just because it's uh, when there are caps, you take the leave because you use it or you lose it? Yeah, I, I mean, I think that um, so caps are important and caps are one way to restrain uh, leave balances from growing and, and the problem of, you know, leave liability escalating. But then, you know, if you are going to lose your leave um, at the end of the year, then people are inclined to, uh, to, to use it potentially when they maybe wouldn't. And, to, it, you know, one really interesting thing we found is that um, these, uh, these policies that had been developed in the private sector much more than the um, the public sector to sort of combine the ca the, the categories um, work in a really interesting way because they come they cut out a lot of the complications and um, when they're taking to their extreme um, that you can have uh, you know what is it called it's PTO um, right. um, which stands for. That's Linda, paid time, they, yeah, that's paid time off. Yep. Paid time off. You sort of lump everything together and, and take into the extreme. And this isn't done in the public sector, but it is done in the private sector. Um, you know, there's not a limit to the leave that you can take uh, necessarily. There's not a limit to vacation or sick leaves. It's up to the employees. But interestingly, uh, employees tend to take less time off and they don't have any, um, <clears throat> they don't develop any leave liability. Right, right. Um, Linda, did I say that pretty accurately? You did. Um, you know, it's it is an interesting dynamic. We've seen our company um, does that, where we call it um, your time, and essentially there there are no, you know, and it is a benefit for sure to our company because to your point, there is no liability now, so you're not carrying anything on the books, and so it certainly is a win for the organization as much as it is for the employee. Um, but not having any restrictions around that, I think, takes the pressure off of an employee for taking time off as well. So to your point, use it or lose it policies force you into a situation where you're going to take that time because you feel like you've earned it, it's yours and you should have it. When you have this flexibility to be able to take um, what time you need when you need it. Now, I won't say it's not without issues because I do think you, know, you still have a situation where you can have abuse, um, but I think you see less abuse in those situations um, because it is a little more open. Um, but again, you know, like we said, in the public sector, there's a reason why leave is used in the private sector, we have the opportunity to provide things like, um, you know, raises, for example, um, you know, that's, that's a big deal. So yeah, I mean, and um, I mean, Denver, right, Linda is, is a place that has gone to uh, kind of a modified paid time off uh, way of, of doing things so that they don't have the complicated you know, many leave categories that other places have, but that meant kind of exposing the amounts of leave that employees were getting. This was when it was done maybe a number of years ago, yes. but it, they reduced the total amount of leave that employees would have. That didn't go over very well initially, but it's led to a, a much, I think an easier um, 
an, an easier program to administer and less liability. Well, and it's very straightforward um, because when we made that change, when I was at Denver, um, a lot of the reasons behind it were to reduce that liability, but also get better controls of the programs because, you know, in that decentralized environment, we did have, um, you know, a lot of different ways that leave was being used. And we had people that were tracking things off the books, which created audit issues. Um, and so there were a lot of um, reasons why we looked at it and you're right it didn't go over very well at first but I think since then employees have really adapted to it and again now they know exactly what it is and it's fair and consistent no matter what agency you work for what department you're in it's all the same and I think that that made a big difference because historically that was not the case it was it was different depending upon where you worked well that's great this is let's let's shift gears a little bit and talk a little bit about uh about a, a little bit of a broader topic of leave management. Before we do that, I wanna to speak directly to the audience. Um, there is no need to wait until the session is nearly over to ask your questions. Um, you should feel very free to be, uh, to be uh, using your, your chat or your, or your question or whatever, whatever means you have for, uh, for communicating to ask questions as we go. It'll make things uh, move a lot more smoothly at the end so that we don't have 10 questions coming in the last minute and 35 seconds. So I encourage you all to do that um, as, as we move forward. Let's talk about leave management. And I think I, I'm going to ask Linda to keep talking for a little bit, if you don't mind. Um, it felt to Catherine and to me that the that, that key to leave management is, 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 is good data systems and good data analysis. Um, and that kind of without that, without knowing without having a commonality of language with which to communicate, and that language is data, um, we had very little hope of really managing leave in a successful way. Do you agree with that? And if so, can you tell us a little bit about that, Linda? I do. Um, you know, in my experience over the years, both working in government and now supporting government in my role, um, it is it has continued to be a challenge when you don't have good systems in place for a myriad of reasons and not having good data. Because how do you make decisions around what's happening? Um, for example, there was one government entity where we looked at um, where they were there was one department where 50% of their employees were on an active FMLA. Um, so, and you would think that if half your workforce is out on leave, that that would see a big spike in overtime um, because the other half then is picking up the load. And what we found was well, it wasn't affecting overtime at all. Um, and it, the jobs still seemed to be getting done. And so then it made us take a look at that and say, do we need the other 50% of that workforce if they're not there working anyway? <laughs> um, and so, you know, it's amazing the information that you can find. You can also look at it from a way to, um, to figure out employee satisfaction. Um, you know, it's a great tool for HR to be able to look at a lot of different things that are happening. So if you see high, um, high absentee within a department, it makes you start to wonder what's going on with that department. You know, do they, um, do we need to put more wellness programs in place? Um, are there disgruntled employees? Is it a management issue? Um, there's a lot of things that you can gather from it. Sometimes we look at it so much to just um, identify abuse or fraud, but oftentimes there's so much more information that you can find by analyzing the data and being able to look at patterns and trends. Um, you know, like jokingly, they've called the FMLA has been the Friday Monday Leave Act. Um, and um, we've done some studies as a company to see like a spike in the number of employees who call off after a um, Sunday football game, for example, or how many employees um, are out the day after the Super Bowl. Um, you know, it's like there's a lot Lot of different trends and patterns that you can start to identify when you have the systems in place. Um, but I do think it's really important to be able to take a look at that and, and identify. And if you do have a high um, instance of illness, for example, are there some programs that you could put in place to help combat that? So we've seen a big trend towards more wellness programs in public sector and being able to provide those types of um, tools and um, resources to employees, um, you know, whether that be mental health or, um, you know, a lot of uh, programs around health and fitness, um, different things of that. So it's amazing to me what you can gather 
just by looking at that type of data um, and looking at it through a more humanistic point of view instead of always looking at it just purely at the numbers you know like what are the numbers yeah. tell us so yeah you, you know, well, something else was occurring to me with with good technological systems, um, you also can produce real time data for your employees. Um, and I think that that's really a, a, a great benefit because and I think I we talked to Alicia about this, um, that it really it really builds trust in in the whole system if employees can see what their own leave balances yeah. are, you know, and are, are as of this minute. Alicia? Yeah, wasn't Alicia, that right? could you talk about employee access to leave balances? Yes, yes. Is that whenever we went to a fully electronic system back in 2012, that was one of the immediate benefits was the, the employees had instant access to any any and all leave balances. Uh, they can do it online. They could even do it via phone call to a 1-800 number if they don't have a, a way to access something online. They can check it at a time clock if the, you know if they're a time clock employee. Um, I mean, just a, there's a million ways to check it now that don't involve having to go to a supervisor or an administrative support person and say, hey, can you tell me what my leave balances are, um, which was the situation we were in prior to implementing that system where you know it was basically kept on, it was kept in a, in a database, but the person had to have access to it to look it up and then share that information with an employee and so again it increased employee trust and you know at first the everybody thinks the system will it's not calculating it right but, you know once you kind of show them here's how it works and here's how here's where it calculated it um the it, it's great and employees trust that the balances are accurate and it's, it's been a great benefit for our folks and alicia if you could if you could expand that a little bit if when, 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 when employees have that kind of access, does that help, uh, does that help to, to avoid um, friction uh, that, that, that emanates from perceived uh, unfairness? Um, well, you know, when it comes to, to one person thinking something's getting a benefit over another, probably so. It just, uh, um, I don't know that it, most of the perceptions of unfairness from, for our employees are, are the way you leave is used. Um, and employees who seem to be taking off more than others and they, you know, they don't necessarily even know if it's paid or unpaid time. They just know that this person employee A is absent more frequently than, than they think they should be and they don't know why and they're having to pick up their workload. Um, so I, I think it's, it's been a great benefit. I'm not sure that it's helped with a lot of those perceptions, but it's, uh, it's definitely at least let employees know that they, they were getting the benefits they were entitled to. Something I'd like to kind of shift over to over the course of years, we, we, Catherine and I have been covering cities and state governments for, well, actually, I could tell you how long, but she never wants me to say the number of years. So, so I'll say, I'll just say decades. Um, and one of, the, one of the issues that comes up repeatedly, uh, notwithstanding the issue covered, is, is are the advantages of centralization versus decentralization. And for lead policies, I think that that's, that's, that's an important factor, isn't it? Yeah, it, it really is. As we did our interviews to do this report, um, we found that um, because leave can be so complicated if it is decentralized, um, you've got different agencies, even different divisions within uh, an agency handling leave differently. Um, also, we heard, you know, one story uh, someone told us is, you know, there was a very unfortunate case. I think this was in uh, Mesa, um, the, the, the you know employee was very sick. He had a, a very aggressive form of cancer, and in order to um, to figure out his his uh, the kind of leave he could have, they, they had to get about ten different people around the table because everybody had a different you know specialization, and it just got so complicated to figure out you know how to help this employee that. Um, you know, it was one of many factors that led them to really centralize their leave administration um, so that they could have specialists who understood the whole picture. I mean, so that you wouldn't have, you wouldn't need somebody who had a specialty in, um, you know, uh, disability benefits and somebody else who had a specialty in payroll and somebody, but that, that all of the, the understanding of leave was in one spot and that seemed yeah. to work much better. Let me keep you talking, um, at least for now. Um, is, there, is there a need for more oversight? 
Yeah, I mean, it, so what Rich was saying before, I mean, we've, we've spent so much time, you know, over the course of years looking at, like the things that go wrong in government management generally, and a lot of the same issues come up. Um, last year, we did a, a report for UKG um, about uh, overtime. And, and there are a lot of the same issues that you, that if you have really lax approval processes, then you're going to get kind of unfair systems in which one employee gets something and another employee does not. Um, and so you need you need to have you know the you need to have supervisors who know what they're doing and who are really paying attention and who are following policies accurately. And you know another really important thing was that you you need to document what you're doing so that you can make sure that. Um, the leave balances are accurate and accurately recorded and all of that. So I think, you know, the, in, in the poll that we did before, the, the, um, the internal controls came out as the thing that people thought was the least important. It still is getting, I think, 35%, you know, said this was something that they were concerned about. But from reading multiple audits over time, boy, those, those management controls are really important. Yeah. And Catherine, I think part of the problem with that too is because of the way government leave liability is accrued and the way that it's it's one of those things where you keep kicking the can down the road. And so, you know, you the oversight isn't maybe where like overtime can have an immediate effect because there's a cash impact to it where leave until an employee is getting ready to retire or a catastrophic event happens or they, um, they terminate employment. Leave liability is something you literally can continue Continue to pretend like it's not there and um, but it is it does have an impact and the cost down the road is quite expensive and when employees are retiring and we're seeing a big uptick again that's a huge impact to an agency as well because they don't budget for those things um, you know ahead of time they're not they're not looking at it each year usually it's at the beginning they go through and say who do we think is going to um, leave this year and usually that's coming out of the general fund because there are no dollars available for them to uh, to pay that so there is an impact I just think it's one of those things where it's like out of sight out of mind and so it doesn't get the oversight that it probably needs yeah let's 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 move forward if we can to uh to to, to another uh question to involve to involve our uh, attendees we have another uh another another query a polling question uh coming up and uh i'll read it to you as i did before well the same trick as earlier on uh, as data analysis becomes a more valuable tool what would you most like to learn from your data? And again, check all that apply. And I'll give you 45, 50 seconds. I, if anybody would like, I can sing a little song just to give you back <laughs> music. But, uh, I don't think actually anybody would like that. I think if that was poll question number three, we'd get 99% no and the 1% yes would be me. <laughs> And I'm guessing which will be uh, which will be number one. We'll see if I'm right. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna lead the lead the uh, audience. You think you know which one's gonna be? I most. think I I think I I think I know. And I was no, I wasn't right. <laughs> um, what I would have guessed would have been impact of remote work on on leave usage, because it's such a hot topic. And I came I came close, but. Uh, it was really the patterns of how employees are taking leave, which is really such an interesting thing. I think it was Linda who earlier on uh, talked about, maybe it was Linda, maybe it was Alicia who talked about uh, detecting when, you know, on Super Bowl weekend, suddenly it becomes a four day weekend or whenever there's, whenever there's a three day weekend, it's a four day weekend, uh, not because people are necessarily sick more on four day weekends, but because it's kind of nice to stretch them out a little bit. Um, the item that, that, uh, that came up the least frequently, which is interesting, is the comparison of agencies leave use. Um, it's interesting that the audience has said that. Um, and I want to I wanna do something a little tricky with this one. Catherine, what would you think are the, is the value of comparing how the agencies, uh, the agencies uh, uh, do you, uh, use leave? I mean, that's yeah. something people aren't interested in. Should they be or, or, yeah, or is well, there a case for? I, I think it really is. It is interesting whenever you benchmark, you know, one 
body against another, you see where things are working out really well and where things are not. Um, and that's useful to kind of analyze, like, what are the differences? Why in one agency are people not taking leave and in another one, um, there's a, you know, a high rate of absenteeism. Um, you, you want to you wanna see what the reasons behind those differences. And I think that's, that's a good reason for comparing agencies. But I understand why uh, some of these other answers are getting more attention. Um, I would say that you know, one of the frustrations in working on this report was that we didn't know any answers yet to the impact of remote work on leave usage. And that's really a fascinating one. Yeah, and you know, how, how will that turn out? Will people be you know, less likely to take sick leave if they can work at home? Um, or you know, just it, it, we figure that it will have an effect, but we don't know what it is. Great. Well, thank you so much, uh, audience members, for, for, for answering, uh, and, in a, and in a nice, diffuse fashion, which makes for more interesting things to say. Um, the, the last thing kind of that's probably worthwhile are talking about before we go to Q&A are uh, what's next? You know, where, where, where are we going from here? And I think maybe a good place to start is kind of where, where uh, Catherine just left off, which is the impact of remote work on leave. Um, it's 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 a new thing. It's 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 a it's a uh, it's it's an interesting and 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 important thing. There was a period of time early on when it appeared in the pandemic that remote work was a temporary solution, um, and so it wasn't going to be sort of a long term issue. It was something to just patch things over during the period of time that the pandemic uh, was 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 raging. Um, what Kath and I have seen is that uh, remote work has become popular for a variety of reasons other than just a way to, uh, to work remotely from other people who might carry uh, COVID. Uh, among other things, many uh, states and cities have discovered they can save a lot of money on real estate by continuing to have remote work. If people are only working in an office three days a week, you can maybe cut down your office space by, by 40%, saves a lot of money. Um, with, with that sort of in mind, I guess the question is, um, and I don't know who wants to take this one. I, I'll, I'll wait for somebody just to speak and then that'll be the person who'll be talking. Um, curious to hear your, your impressions of what the, uh, of, of what the impact on, uh, on remote work on leave is, is now and is gonna be in the future. I'll, I'll speak to Ardott's uh, perspective on this. You know, of course, prior to the pandemic, we didn't have remote work as, as a viable option at all. I mean, that just was not available to employees for any reason other than emergency use for the convenience of the department. And of course, when we, you know, initially the governor, you know, announced, hey, you send all state workers who can work remotely home to work remotely while we, you know, get through this pandemic. And of course, you know, we sent about 700 employees home to work remotely uh, during those first several months of the pandemic. But for us, you know, a big portion of our of our workforce, over two thirds of our workforce, is not available to work remotely. They work out in the field. They work on construction sites. They work on um, maintenance of the roads, and so that's not work that can be done remotely. And um, and we've we've struggled to overcome a lot of this. Goes back to that perceptions of unfairness. You know, they they see these remote workers as getting some kind of benefit um, from from this uh, pandemic that that they aren't getting. And, uh, and what we've found is that, that for the most part, people are actually working longer hours and taking less time off than they were, you know, prior, prior to the pandemic. And, um, and you know, and, and it, we can see it reflected in, you know, that they have to care for, like maybe they have a, um, a parent who lives in the home with them who doesn't need constant care, but they need someone present, you know, in the, in the house with them and, and with, to do little things. You know, that's had a big impact on people who've been able to remote work and do that. You know, same thing goes for children who are not not toddlers or, or, you know, small children that require a lot of attention, but, you know, children who are old enough to kind of care for themselves. It's been a big benefit for those employees to be able to uh, be available and at home in those situations without having to use their own leave. Well, and I think it will be interesting, too, to see how um, 
to your point, Rich, what we'll see around um, leave utilization, because, you know, usually if you're calling in sick and you're sick, you don't want to go to the office um, to make everyone else ill. Um, but if I can, if I'm well enough to go um, sit at my computer, um, I just didn't want to, you know, I'm contagious, so I don't want to get everybody else sick. I'm probably not going to call in sick. I'm going to go sit behind my computer and do my, right. my job that day. And so that'll be interesting. And then also um, the willingness to have some flexibility. So again, in government, you know, we have a level of accountability to all of our hours, whether you're a salaried or an hourly employee. And so, you know, a lot of times you're having to, you've got to run out for an appointment, you're recording time there, but will we allow more flexibility in a remote environment to say, maybe it's not as important to have you sitting in your chair from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m. What's more important is, are you getting your job done? And so can we actually take a look at that and figure out, you know, what type of flexibility do we allow around that? And will that also then allow for less time out of the office um, because or away from work, because you have that flexibility to maybe take those, you're going to, you know, go to an appointment early in the morning, and then you're going to come back, but you're going to work a couple hours later that um, that night or, um, you know, more flexibility in the, the work day um, could also then create less reason for employees to take time off. But then you also have the issue um, to Alicia's point that people are working more hours. How do you create a work life balance? Because if you have not worked from home in the past, like I've worked remotely for many years, and so I've created um, off hours, if you will, for myself as to when so I can have somewhat because otherwise you can find yourself pretty much on call 24 um, seven. And that's not healthy either. Um, so how do you figure out what that balance is? And how do you help support employees? So I, I do think that remote work opens up a whole new um, uh, you know, opportunity in uh, both uh, really good opportunities, but then also there's going to be some challenges that come with it to figure out how does the workforce look now? Um, and how does that affect leave? A really good point. And actually, uh, after after the webinar is over, uh, perhaps you can teach Catherine and me how to actually have a work day that doesn't go to the course. That would be that would be a great lesson that could uh, that could help us. Let's let's hit one more topic and then we're gonna go to QA. And and the last topic I think is an appropriate one because it's something that we saw was one of the very hottest topics uh, coming into the work we did, which is uh, paid parental leave. Uh, it's, 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 uh, we see an increasing number of, 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 of states, municipalities that are, that, are, that, are, that are encouraging people to take paid parental leave and that are offering it uh, uh, in different ways and uh, increasingly to both uh, women and to men, uh, which is, I would view as a good thing. Um, uh, and I think everybody sort of agrees. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a hot topic. And I guess, let me, let me start off by asking Alicia, uh, I, and I'd like to sort of try to do this in, in a triangular way. Alicia, can you tell me why it's such a hot topic now? Oh, I mean, really, because it's, it's just a significant benefit for employees to have that time to bond with a new child, whether it's an adopted child or a biological child. It's, um, you know, we, we've only had it in place for, I guess, maybe four years now, three and a half. I, I can't remember exactly when it was um, legislated, but, you know, we give employees four weeks of paid um, parental leave, whether you're uh, the father or the mother, you, you know, for, for the adoption of a new child or for the birth of a new child, um, to give them a chance to, to bond with the children and to, and, you know, just, just collect their thoughts and, and get life going on a pattern because you know that a new baby in somebody's home that's a disruption and and I know for our employees it's really been a significant benefit we we've had a lot of positive feedback about that and now Linda Linda can you give us some kind of a notion as to how widely spread maybe you or Catherine can can sort of talk about how 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 widely spread am I right that this is sort of a hot topic almost every place 
Yeah, I would agree. I, Catherine probably has better information based on her research um, for sure, but I'm definitely seeing more and more of this um, for all the reasons that Alicia said. And it is one of those things where, again, it helps to manage that leave because if you're not getting giving that to employees and giving them that opportunity they're going to find a way to take the time anyway um, or you could create a situation where it's elongated because you haven't given them the proper amount of time to have that um, you know have that time with with children but i also think it's a cultural shift we're seeing across the country as well and maybe that came out of the pandemic is um, the importance of family um, and the importance of really being able to provide that proper care but I don't know Catherine what did, what did you see when you were looking at things well I, I agree it really is a hot topic I what I I think um, both Rich and I saw is we went to um, the mid-year meeting of the National Association of State Personnel Executives right before the pandemic um, began um, and this was so much a topic that was on on the minds of the HR directors from around the states um, and what I thought was really interesting is just another issue that comes up with paid parental leave. People love the idea um, because it because of work life balance, because it's a great benefit for employees. It attracts younger people, and everybody at the time was, and, and I think now still was extremely interested in recruiting and getting people to want to work for government. On the other hand, it it um, presented a real staffing challenge for people. I mean, and this is an, you know, another issue with leave is that the more generous you are with leave or the, you know, the more that you realize that the leave benefits that you're giving can help attract and retain employees has this other side of it, which is you have to deal with the um, staffing issues that come up when people are taking the leave. So, I mean, so it is, it's, it's a difficult question for states um, and local governments to, to deal with. Of course, everything is a difficult question yes, for states true. and local governments to deal with. <laughs> and, and having said that, um, let's, let's shift over to some Q&A. We've got about eight minutes for that, and that should do quite nicely, I hope. Um, we have a question for Alicia um, specifically, um, which is what process did Arkansas use to develop and implement the open leave balance system, employee access? Was that decided at the departmental level? Well, actually that was just a natural process when we implemented the new system. It was just a feature that was available um, from the UKG Workforce Central system. So, I mean, for us, it was a no brainer that once we knew that was available that we wanted to make that immediately available to employees. So, I mean, I guess it was it was probably a team made by our implementation team for the for the system initially, but um, that was a real easy decision to make. Um, next question. Um, with states working to be employers of choice, I like that phrase, what specific strategies can states implement around leave management that will help attract and retain employees? And I think that that's something that uh, it's, it's, it's a big, big question. And I wouldn't mind hearing uh, from more than one of you uh, uh, in response to that. Catherine? This is the advantage. This is this is yeah. this is the advantage and the disadvantage. If I if I if I if I give question, uh, Catherine a question that she can't answer quite well, I'll pay for it later on. On the other hand, I think she's the smartest person I know, so I assume she always can. Well, thank you, Richard. Um, you know, I think that part of it is really focusing on the fairness of leave, and which is a lot of what we've been talking about today, and the clarity of the practices so that people know what leave they're getting and how it will change as they spend more time in the organization. Um, and if you're talking about retention too, um, the idea that you benefit from staying longer at the organization, um, that, that you benefit with more leave as you stay longer. Yeah. I think that's a very nice policy that a lot of places have. Alicia, anything yeah, you're doing? You know, from our perspective, really we try to actually use it as part of um, a total compensation worksheet. You know, when we're trying to recruit, we take a brochure at a lot of our recruiting events that kind of show employees the dollar value 
associated with the with the the leave that we give, and um, and you know, a lot of times that gets their attention because they don't realize that you know their salary may be this amount, but but really the value of their benefits, both the leave and retirement benefits, are are way above just their basic salary. And a lot of times it's it's an additional sixty five percent when you really calculate it out for paid holidays, uh, annual leave, sick leave, you know, all of the paid benefits that we offer. Alicia, can I ask you, this isn't the question that came from the audience, but can you go on mm -hmm. just add for one more minute the, the notion of, of uh, total, total compensation as opposed to what people traditionally thought about was compensation was just your salary, but, but, but sort of the, 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 the evolution in, in states and municipalities of looking at total compensation is really the way to compare one job to the next. Yeah, you know, it and, and that goes back to what, what um, you all mentioned earlier about sometimes, you know, it's hard as a public sector employer to really pay competitive base salaries um, to compared to the private sector. And so, you know, the total compensation calculations, you know, they, they include some of the, like your, the value of your insurance benefits, the, the value of our contributions to your retirement system, you know, the actual value of, of the leave benefits that we offer. And so, you know, that, that, that's really, it, it gets people's attention, you know, when you can provide a total compensation statement to let employees know, you know, hey, your, your work is far more valuable than just what we pay you in your take home pay. And, uh, and that's been well received. And, and I think it's been a good tool for us. I just see a uh, something coming across the chat from, from somebody in the audience saying we use a total compensation calculator in our, I couldn't tell whether it was a state or, or a city, but that's, that's, that's sort of an interesting idea. Um, another question, which is, I don't know if anybody can answer it, but it's come from the audience and I might as well ask, um, do you know the prevalence of states offering bonuses, especially at separation? Catherine, you might, you might I know don't, this. Does I anybody don't know. Answer that? I've not seen that often. I mean, I was really surprised and impressed when Alicia said that um, what uh, what Arkansas does, honestly, because it's it's not something that I've historically seen simply because of the cash impact, right? And so, um, so seeing that, I've heard more talk about bonuses, and we've certainly seen, you know, more prevalence around the bonus, not necessarily related to to leave specifically or upon that, but um, but I am seeing more with the stimulus dollars coming in, finding other ways to utilize those dollars to to reward employees um, hmm. through that through a bonus. But I've I've not seen a high prevalence in in my experience. Okay, and one last question we have, and then. Uh... And then we'll kind of wrap things up. Uh, and we've only got a couple of minutes. So the, the question is, um, given, given, the, the, given the huge sums of money coming to states and localities from the federal government, does anyone think that's going to have any impact on the generosity of leave benefits? I don't think so. I think government is wise enough to know that those are short term funds. Um, you know, there's a big influx that's coming in. And I think that well, the government's been through this um, enough times to know that they're going to be smart about how they're using these dollars. Hopefully they take advantage of being able to do some things they hadn't been able to do before. But I don't think that it's going to have any impact on on like changing benefits, uh, just my personal opinion. Yeah, and actually, that's 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 sort of the right answer, um, I think, because the Government Finance Officers Association um, put together a, a a list of guidelines um, for how that money should be spent. And number one on that list of guidelines was that money should not be spent for ongoing um, expenditures. It's one-time money, and it's sort of contrary to good financial uh, rules to have one-time money spent on. Uh, on operating expenditures will continue after the money stops coming in. And with that, let me thank you all very much. I would like to thank our panelists. I'd like to thank uh, NASCA. I'd like to thank UKG. I'd like to thank my mother and father. And, um, and let me uh, pass it over to Pam to just bring us home. Thank you, Rich, so much. Um, I'll also thank your brother and father, why not? Um, also thanks to Catherine, to Linda, and to Alicia for being with us here today. 
really intriguing conversation. And I've been watching some of the comments from the states, Louisiana, Missouri, and others that have been posting. I'm um, just interesting conversations there. Alicia, I know there was a request if you could um, perhaps share some of the information from our dot, that would be very helpful. We'd be happy to share that um, through NASCA resources as well. So again, thank you so much for joining us for today's national webinar around leave management policies and practices. The recording will be posted to NASCA's Knowledge Center at nasca.org in just a few days. Again, if we have any other resources from um, UKG, from Barrett and Green, or from Arkansas, we'll be posting those as well. Also watch for the paper that's coming out from UKG and know that NASCA is going to be um, accompanying that with some key takeaways for state chief administrators and your teams as well. So thank you so much for joining us today. We appreciate you being with us. Stay tuned for our next event for um, the National Web Webinar Series next week. We'll see you soon.